So I used to live up in northeast China. Oh, great. And I lived right across from Dendong. Yeah, very cool. <laughs> yeah. What year was this? Uh, when you were but in swaddling clothes, Tom. <laughs> from Recorded Future News, I'm Dina Temple Raston. And this is Click Here's Mic Drop, an extended cut of an interview we did that we think you might want to hear a little more of. And today, we're talking to Tom Hagel, a threat researcher at Sentinel One who got a rare inside look at the unconventional way that North Korea is testing new strains of malware. We see them mix and mash, smash and grab, get things done as quickly as possible. And how getting things done as quickly as possible might just work to their advantage. Stay with us. I'm Dina Temple Rust, and this is Click Here's Mic Drop. What got you into North Korea? Well, it was just kind of the, the emergence of running into North Korean threat activity across the networks I've been enlisted to protect. Tom Hagel works at Sentinel Labs. It's a threat intelligence outpost run by Sentinel One. And the reason we spoke to Tom, who you may remember from Tuesday's episode on the North Korean hacking group Scarcroft, is because recently he landed a pretty huge get. He snuck into a kind of digital lab that Scarcroft and other North Korean hacking groups were using to test their latest malware. We asked him, but he wouldn't tell us how he got inside. This was an environment that we just kind of happened to uh, get access to. And it turns out North Korea has a slightly weird way of testing its malicious code. Most people test code in something called a sandbox. It's basically an isolated environment on a network. It mimics the outside environment, but because it's separate, it allows you to work with suspicious code without harming the host device or a network. It's a little like Vegas. What happens in a sandbox stays in a sandbox. And typically, sandbox testing goes down a little like this. A so-called red team will launch an attack with the new malware. And then a blue team will try to defend against the attack. Exercises like this are a great way to ensure that the new code works. And big league threat actors like Russia and China tend to spend a lot of time in the sandbox, making sure everything works just right. But when Tom was tiptoeing around inside North Korea's digital environment, he noticed that its vetting process wasn't nearly this sophisticated and buttoned up. Do we know if they have red teams and blue teams? Yeah, you know, it's it depends how you look at this because um, technically all the stuff we're talking about here is all like red teams. Um, <laughs> they're going outbound and, and attacking elsewhere. In other words, North Korea is heavy on red team attacks, but pretty light on testing the blue team defenses. Rather than going through a, a rigorous um, testing environment to make sure things are controlled and locked down, it tends to be a little bit more kind of fly by the seat of your pants rather than <laughs> whatever the phrase is to, uh, to kind of get the project done and, and working. Right. So they're more quantity than quality. Yeah. Yeah, I would say so. The way Tom sees it, North Korea appears to be impatient. It wants to get any malware they've written up and running. So, rather than audition their malicious code inside a sandbox... A lot of that testing just happens to be done in the wild. The wild, where the rest of us are, in the real world. So it's less of a test and more of a very hard launch. And this, Tom says, is one of the things that sets North Korean hackers apart from other threat actors. I wouldn't say they're as sophisticated as the Chinese cluster of threat actors. What they lack in broad expertise and like vulnerability developments that that China has, North Korea possesses such a high level of creativity in different attack methods. That hurry up and break things mentality of North Korean state hackers means that they're much more nimble and strike much more quickly. But it also means they make a lot of mistakes. The kinds of mistakes that allow researchers, like Tom, to slip into their testing environment and watch them work. You know, 
that's how ultimately what allows us to track them so well and kind of attribute them to multiple campaigns. But that's not to say North Korea is sloppy. They do what a lot of workers do in autocratic regimes. They keep a lot of metrics to prove their worth. This is what's working. This is what isn't working. They're constantly reading um, cybersecurity blogs and news to understand what other actors are doing. And learning from their experiences and those of others. This is going to be an incredibly naive question, which is, how do they get good at this? Do they have, like, high-speed internet? Do they have something to train these people? There's a lot of mystery around it and a lot of potentials. Um, there's no public evidence of this happening yet, um, but we do see some potential collaboration with uh, the Chinese government to house these individuals and train them within China. Um, there's also a, a very strategic education program in North Korea to provide them um, access to the internet to develop skills and to operate externally. But there is the case of collaboration with North Korean allies for sure. A lot of it's kind of like, we're just really trying to figure it out still on where this expertise is coming from and the, the creativity. Like nearly everything coming out of the Hermit Kingdom, those details are something the regime insists on keeping pretty locked down. From Recorded Future News, this has been Mic Drop. It was produced, written, and edited by Kat Shooknecht, Lucas Riley, Sean Powers, and me, Dina Temple Raston. We'll be back with an all-new episode of Click Here on Tuesday. Have a great weekend.